And our next activity is going to be the Fall Technical Workshop in Denver. That's in the first week of October. This is the workshop on the full range of issues associated with integrating wind and solar into electric, gas, and thermal systems, and coupling to energy-consuming infrastructures ranging from transportation to buildings and water, all aided by data and communications. Registration is going to be open shortly, and everyone is invited to attend. It's not a members-only meeting. I think that ESIG is really quite a unique organization, and uh, I don't think you'll find anything else quite like it around. And if you're new to ESIG, I strongly encourage you to follow up with us if you like what you hear, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. You can find us at www.esig.energy. Okay, I want to mention just a few logistical matters before we get started. First of all, the phones are going to be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid any unnecessary distractions. Hopefully, uh, Jim and I won't be too distracting. <laughs> um, for questions and answers, please use the uh, question and answer box on the lower right-hand side of your screen and not the chat box on the top of the screen. We're not going to be monitoring the chat box, so be sure to use the Q&A box in the lower right. We're going to save uh, 10 or 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. And we'll plan to wrap it up at the top of the hour. And an email link will be provided once the presentations and the audio file have been posted. So with, with that background, um, <clears throat> let me go ahead with our description of our webinar and speaker today. The webinar will feature Professor Jim McCauley from Iowa State University. Jim received his BS, MS, and PhD degrees from Georgia Tech. Jim, we're not going to hold that against you. <laughs> and, uh, Jim's an Anson Martson <clears throat> Distinguished Professor and the London Professor of Power Systems Engineering in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Iowa State University, where he's been since 1992. And he was an elected, <clears throat> elected a fellow of IEEE in 2003. Prior to Iowa State, Jim was at PG&E from 1985 to 1990, where he was a transmission engineer. He was engaged in performing planning, design, and operating studies for the Western U.S. power grid and was a registered professional engineer. So Jim had a, a world of practical experience before he went over to academia, where he's been doing a really great job of working with industry and educating the next generation of power engineers. I've personally known Jim for the past seven or eight years, during which time he's been an active participant in ESIG and UVIG before that, and I've come to greatly value the contributions that he makes. Under his leadership and through the close cooperation with industry and especially MISO, Jim has applied state-of-the-art power system planning and optimization techniques to the expanded transmission planning problem, working closely with DOE and NREL in his most recent work, which we'll hear about today. This webinar will present the results of the NREL-led SEAM study, which identified cost-effective options for upgrading the U.S. electrical grid between the eastern and western interconnections. This will create a more integrated power system that can drive economic growth and increase efficient development and utilization of the nation's abundant energy resources, including solar, wind, and natural gas. Okay, a little bit of a lengthy background, but uh, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I'll turn it over to Jim, and he'll uh, take us through the webinar. Jim. All right. Thanks a lot, Charlie. It was a gracious introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak. Uh, ESIG is uh, my favorite uh, technical uh, forum of, of each year. Uh, I typically go to, to several uh, of the activities, and they're extremely well run. So um, I'm just really pleased to, to be able to contribute a little bit more here in this way. And the first slide here has a few names. I just want to recognize Armando, Ali, Hussam, Navanov, or uh, were uh, folks at Iowa State that worked on this project. Uh, Armando is now with MISO, Ali's uh, at University of Calgary, Hussam is at New York ISO, and Abhinav is doing PhD work here uh, with me. He was a master's student when he did uh, participated in this project, uh, and all of them uh, made heavy uh, contributions that uh, I'm really grateful for. Uh, just an overview of the presentation. Uh, and uh, I won't say too much uh, about the path forward, but the other uh, topics uh, we'll get into a little bit. Uh, Charlie already sort of introduced the project. It was led by NREL and uh, particularly Aaron Bloom there uh, and uh, Iowa State uh, together with uh, 
several other national labs uh, and uh, probably uh, <clears throat> Pacific Northwest National Lab was uh, one of the uh, heavy uh, participants. Uh, and uh, we had uh, MISO, uh, Southwest Power Pool, and uh, also folks from WAPA uh, intimately <clears throat> uh, participating in the work. Uh, and uh, uh, Argonne and uh, Oak Ridge were also uh, um, <clears throat> important uh, uh, participants in, in the project, uh, and it, this came out of uh, Department of Energy's Grid Modernization Initiative. It's a, <clears throat> essentially a two-year project. We're still uh, working on some of the finer details, but essentially it's uh, it's come to the conclusion its conclusion now. But the basic question that we were interested in addressing in the project was uh, to look at high-capacity interregional transmission, <clears throat> uh, particularly transmission that spans between eastern and western interconnections. And, and ask, answer the question, is, uh, what is the level of value uh, to building additional uh, transmission capacity to interconnect these two asynchronous grids? Uh, and uh, so that's the, the uh, <clears throat> lead off, I guess, for the presentation. I'll be trying to give you some uh, in insight into the nature of the answers that we gave. But just by way of motivation, wanted to speak to this slide. It's a useful one to study at your leisure. Uh, the picture in front of you with respect to the U.S. Uh, showing the two interconnections, actually three, of course, with uh, ERCOT, uh, uh, Eastern, Western, and uh, the dotted line indicates the approximate boundary between the three interconnections. Uh, and in addition, you're seeing resources uh, that are indicated by the legend on uh, the right-hand side of the screen, <clears throat> hydro, fossil, wind, solar. Uh, and uh, hydro, of course, is, uh, is existing, uh, but the wind and solar colors, uh, this is indicating not uh, uh, to any extent existing resource, uh, but the resource quality uh, of uh, if you were to build solar or wind in those areas. And the blue, of course, is wind. The yellow is, uh, is uh, solar resource quality, and, uh, and the green is the combination of the two. Uh, it's not to suggest that a particular area that's not colored doesn't have any uh, capability to build wind or solar in that region. It's just to indicate this is the richest uh, area of, of, of the country in the south for solar, and particularly in the southwest and in the midwest for, uh, for wind. When you think about it like that uh, and uh, sort of get that picture in your mind, <clears throat> you can uh, come to some conclusions about what might be valuable in terms of building transmission across the scene. Uh, some specific things that uh, stand out that might be motivational are, you know, to recognize when uh, daily peaks occur, and this has to do with uh, the time zone issue. Uh, we have uh, four time zones that are being spanned here, uh, and uh, those have uh, a significant influence on the diurnal peaks. And uh, that suggests that there may be some benefit to sharing energy uh, during the time when one area is peaking and another area is not. Uh, the other thing that's not shown here really is the fact that you have annual peaks occurring as well in different times. And because you have annual peaks occurring at different times, that suggests the possibility of sharing capacity. Uh, the picture in the upper left-hand uh, corner of the slide is indicating population density. It's a little bit of dated picture, uh, but uh, yet it's, I think, still characterizes well the population density of the country. And it's clear the story it's telling. Uh, people live on the coast primarily, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, as you sort of enter into the midsection of the country, the population uh, density decreases. Um, and uh, so the load density has that variation. Um, and uh, then, of course, we're all recognizing that the meteorological conditions that drive wind and solar and to, uh, also, uh, to some extent, the uh, hydro uh, resource is, uh, is going to vary across the country. And so these suggest then, you know, that you might be able to gain some benefit by extending the concept of sharing between neighbors that we've had for many decades now. So uh, I think it's still the case that uh, different neighbors, uh, be it uh, utility companies or, uh, or uh, ISOs uh, operationally, uh, are sharing both energy as well as capacity, and we've been doing that for a while. Uh, but typically, it's neighbor to neighbor, although it can be 
more distant than that, uh, but uh, the idea is can we see benefits from sharing more wi widely, and I'm going to use the term here, wide area sharing, uh, and some things that come to mind as a result of that previous slide are lower cost energy and operating reserves on a daily basis uh, might benefit there, uh, need for new capacity to satisfy planning reserve margins. Uh, is a significant one if we uh, continue to do as we've done uh, for years now to uh, satisfy capacity needs uh, at a regional level, uh, then that can be more costly than if you uh, expand the region to a larger area. Uh, and uh, then the whole thing, uh, discussion about resilience, reliability, uh, adaptability, these are words that come into play when we encounter conditions that are unexpected and we've been uh, dealing with wildfires lately and uh, certainly hurricanes are on people's minds but floods and earthquakes also are there uh, and uh, these uh, can be significantly uh, uh, influenced in, in terms of recovery uh, if you have uh, the ability to share resources and share capacity and finally policy is a thing that we uh, consider uh, for frequently and uh, every few years uh, we'll get a policy change. Typically these are permanent changes that we have to not necessarily recover from but rather adapt to and again if the sharing concept is in place in a healthy way you can find benefit in that fashion as well. So what we need for uh, sh this wide area sharing is uh, deliverability. Uh, so deliverability enables that and uh, high capacity and a regional transmission <clears throat> is the thing that provides deliverability. And so you would like to look at uh, opportunities then, you know, to find uh, deliverability that we don't have today, and that's where it becomes very clear when you start thinking about the deliverability from one side of the country to the other across that uh, steam that uh, uh, divides the eastern interconnection from the west. Now, that's not to say that uh, there is no capacity, transmission capacity, between those two uh, interconnections. Uh, there, there is, in fact, uh, seven or even eight if you go to Canada, but there's seven in the U.S. that are shown on slide seven, and the names of them are given there, and you can see also the capacity of each one of those uh, uh, interconnections. There are all uh, seven of them, uh, including in the eighth one in Canada, are back-to-back -back HVDC connections. Uh, they've been built uh, between the time frame of uh, 1977 and around 2005, uh, and, but their capacity is all rather low. Uh, we have uh, 200 megawatts, 110, uh, 210 megawatts, so that the total U.S. capacity for transmission between the two interconnections is about 1,300 megawatts. So that's 1.3 gigawatts. And if you think about the installed capacity of the entire country, to put that number of 1.3 gigawatts in perspective, there's about 1,000, between 1,000 and 1,100 gigawatts of installed generation capacity in the country. And so we're looking at uh, really a, a very small sliver of that total capacity. Uh, and so even though there is capacity here, relatively speaking, it's not very high. We're not the first ones to think about this. Uh, and this is a nice slide I uh, borrowed from uh, uh, from my friend Aaron Broom, Bloom at uh, NREL uh, that uh, shows there's been thought in this direction uh, as far back as the 1920s when uh, there was a very interesting article written in the Chicago Tribune that showed a beautiful picture <laughs> with transmission uh, essentially going from coast to coast. Uh, and uh, 52, uh, a little bit more recently in 79, Carson Taylor uh, from BPA did a study of, uh, of the uh, interconnection, uh, synchron a synchronized uh, interconnection between East and West. Uh, the statement at the bottom there is kind of interesting. It was in his report that said the Western North American power system was interconnected with the Eastern North America power, power system in 1967. So we were doing it at that time, but only for a, a little while uh, because they involved 230 KV lines, rather uh, weak links in those two strong interconnections, and so there was some stability issues. And so Carson's study in 1979 made an effort to look at the uh, dynamic response of, uh, of, of synchronized connection between the two grids. Uh, there was some more interest in 94, and again by the DOE in, in 2002, where some of these things were investigated. And uh, maybe more recently, 
on slide nine, you'll find some nice pictures of the country, you know, where people have uh, drawn different maps and in certain cases done some studies. Maybe most well known among them was the 2007 uh, uh, model or uh, diagram <clears throat> that was produced by American Electric Power that was a 765 kV concept. Uh, there's a link there that you can read more about that. Uh, people, a lot of people have seen that picture before. Uh, and then if you go all the way uh, down to the right corner, there was a study that I did with a student that works with uh, MISO now, uh, where uh, we were looking at uh, optimizing you know, interconnections across the country, really, uh, and found that there was potentially significant value there. Uh, and uh, more recently, in the upper left-hand corner, was an article written by Chris uh, Clack and some of his colleagues uh, appeared in uh, Nature, uh, where they had a design, uh, intercontinental uh, really design, uh, that also showed benefit. Uh, and then uh, just last year, there was an excellent study done by uh, uh, Yuri Makarov and uh, his colleagues at uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab of uh, the so-called macro grid and HVDC network. And this was a dynamic study uh, that looked at uh, benefits associated with having such a network in terms of uh, frequency response. Uh, and then I put the picture in the middle simply to say that, uh, you know, HVDC uh, is something that we've been thinking about recently quite a bit. Uh, the blue lines uh, are existing HVDC. We have the Pacific DC intertie IPP and the one in the north uh, east and then one uh, from Minnesota to the Dakotas. Uh, but uh, the others, the red ones, are, uh, are ones that are in at some level of in motion and uh, uh, being planned. And, and so, so it's just to suggest that there has been a great deal of interest in, uh, in these kind of inter-regional high-capacity transmission projects for a while. So, this is a high-level overview of the same study project that uh, Aaron Bloom has uh, led. It, led uh, and uh, the first part is CGT is the <clears throat> application that I'm going to be telling you a little bit about. Uh, it's a co-optimized expansion planning application. Uh, the second part is uh, essentially production costs using the fairly well-known tool called Plexus. Many of you may have uh, used that in the past. Uh, and then the third part is uh, essentially powerful studies uh, and uh, PNNL was uh, was doing that part. The picture is uh, sort of suggests the span of those tools. Expansion planning on the right, where we're looking, you know, in terms of uh, 10 to 15 to 20 years. Plexus uh, in the middle, typically one one year kind of analysis. And PSSE, where you're doing, you know, snapshot analysis of uh, of different power flow conditions and understanding the contingency response and so forth. So uh, I show you this to to suggest the, the breadth of, this, of the interconnection seam study. Um, but today, I'm going to be focused on the expansion planning part that we're using the software application called CGD Plan. <clears throat> uh, and a little bit more on the overall study, this is just to suggest that the data that we used among those three parts of the study was, uh, was uh, first of all, high quality data uh, in terms of characterizing wind and solar. Uh, transmission and generation costs and so forth, and network uh, topology and all the impedances, loads. Uh, so all of that uh, came from uh, very reputable and um, quality resource, uh, sources, uh, and uh, it was uh, synchronized across the three studies that uh, that were done. So uh, before I sort of launch into talking a little bit more about the expansion planning part of it, uh, this is an advertisement. Please forgive me, but pertains directly to the topic of the presentation. Uh, next week on Thursday, July 26, there'll be a symposium at Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa, uh, which is where I'm speaking from, uh, on the campus of Iowa State University, uh, to uh, address uh, some more information related to the SEAM study. Uh, and in addition, uh, we'll be uh, looking at uh, sort of the next steps. What might it take? to move this forward, uh, this concept of uh, high-capacity interregional transmission for uh, an, an, another uh, step or two. Uh, so it's a one-day symposium. It's not expensive. Uh, if you're interested, there's a URL in front of you, or you can just do a Google on, uh, uh, on uh, TransGrid X in Iowa State, and I'm sure you'll, you'll pick it up. Uh, but uh, it's invite, uh, the public is invited. Anyone that's listening today is certainly 
welcome, and I would encourage your attendance. Uh, be good to see you. So with that in mind, I just uh, sort of go to the tool that we have uh, that has been used for the expansion planning part of the study. Uh, I refer to it as a co-optimizer or a co-optimization. Uh, and you may have been introduced to this before, but uh, just uh, briefly, if you haven't, uh, I'll give you a couple of slides about the basic idea. It's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not complicated. Uh, the basic idea is to suggest that we can do uh, optimization <clears throat> on generation and transmission simultaneously. So the picture before you has been, is, the, is kind of the way that I did this when I was in industry back in the 80s. Uh, the generation planners would get their plan and tell the transmission planners, essentially, here's the generation that we want to build. Go find transmission to handle it. And then the transmission planners would do that job and, and you'd be done. Uh, and uh, the other approach that you might think of as being slightly better would be to take the transmission plan and go back upstairs and tell the generation planners, hey, you know, I think you might be better off if you move that unit over a few buses because we'd save some money on transmission, and then you go through an iteration or two or maybe 10. Uh, of course, we haven't really formalized this procedure, uh, either in terms of pr a process in the industry uh, or in terms of software, uh, as far as I know, until we started thinking about doing uh, simultaneous optimization, and that's what I mean by CEP. It's essentially equivalent to the better approach uh, if you go around that loop you know, many, many, many times. Uh, and uh, by doing it, you'll find that you can obtain uh, overall solutions, solutions in terms of transmission and generation that are uh, less costly than any solution that you would find doing either one of the above approaches. Uh, and then more recently, we've also said, well, if we can do this with uh, transmission and generation, then we should also be able to include distribution and the motivation there is clear because we're getting you know, a lot of interest in connecting distributed energy resources. And so this part uh, we have been working on and implementing at I Iowa State and other people have been doing the same, uh, but I won't say too much about, about the uh, TG and D co-optimizer. Uh, rather, for this study, we're gonna focus on the uh, T and G, the one uh, that started from the top, okay? So another slide that just might be a little beneficial in terms of uh, visualizing, getting a mental image of the co-optimized expansion planning. Uh, if you think about having a series of choices for uh, where you're going to build generation, how much, what kind of technology, and when, uh, and of course you'll have that choice for each and every potential option that you're considering, then the idea would be to, you know, pick a plan and then run a production cost simulation over the entire uh, simulation period, we call it the decision horizon, uh, enforcing all of the constraints. <clears throat> and then you'll get two things. You'll get the operational cost of that plan plus the investment cost of that plan. And then if you go around this loop many, many times, each time you throw away any more expensive plan and retain only the cheapest, if you go around enough times, you'll find that you get the optimal plan. And uh, so this is a mental image or a way of thinking about co-optimized expansion planning if you add transmission. Uh, so now you have a little bit more complicated, again, technology, amount, timing, location for transmission. And then if you want to go to the final step and add distribution, you see that that's the uh, kind of uh, tool that you'll end up, end up with. So I do want to emphasize that the co-optimized expansion planning is not a predictive tool per se. Uh, rather, we think of it as an exploratory tool. That is, you point it in a certain direction uh, that you're interested in, and uh, then it'll uh, give you information, allow you to explore that trajectory or that, that direction uh, into the future and tell you, uh, teach you things about that particular direction. <clears throat> so uh, this is about as much uh, of an analytical statement as I'll make here in the presentation. Uh, but uh, for those of you that are familiar with uh, optimization models, this is uh, what this is. Uh, at a high level, we're minimizing net pre present value of, uh, as I said before, the investment cost plus the operational cost. And if you have environmental costs, those would be there too. Uh, with assumptions, whatever kind of assumptions on uh, investment costs and load growth, fuel costs, and uh, wind, solar, hydro performance, subject to constraints, clearly you got to satisfy the powerful equations 
you may have operational constraints. You may want to impose investment constraints and environmental constraints, and then there could be others. Uh, and uh, in the end, you identify when you get a solution, uh, then uh, it will tell you which of the dotted lines in the picture uh, to build uh, in terms of transmission, in terms of generation, and if you're doing distribution in terms of uh, DER and, and uh, distribution upgrades. Uh, so we're identifying investments uh, to minimize net present value of investment plus operations over some time period. Typically, we choose uh, 10, 15, 20, maybe 25 years uh, are, are not uncommon time periods, but there's no theoretical reason why you can't choose uh, longer periods than, than that. So uh, in the case in point that we're discussing here, we're going to be looking at a 15-year <clears throat> time period. So to get into that study, this is the, the uh, picture that lays out the, uh, as I mentioned before, the directions that we wanted to study. So we, we sort of thought through this and said, what makes sense in terms of uh, transmission builds the, between the scene, uh, across the scene, between the interconnections? Uh, and, and, and let's then do an optimization on a transmission build that conforms to that direction of exploration. And there were four. The one uh, at the top left-hand corner, number one, number one, this is a reference case. Uh, and uh, it's having no cross-seam uh, tra transmission uh, at all, uh, besides what is, is, is exist, existing today. Uh, but it's being driven by uh, some demand growth, of course, and is being modeled. Uh, appropriate level of demand growth, and uh, in, in, in one case it's being driven by an environmental constraint, in another case it's not, uh, and then you have uh, certain levels of uh, retirements and other influences, uh, but particularly cost, right? <clears throat> cost is a big one in terms of motivating uh, what kind of investment gets made over the 15-year over the time, time period of interest. So that's number one. Number two, A, is to say, well, let's allow the existing back-to-back uh, -back HVDC connections, the ones that exist, let's allow them to expand. Uh, but that's the only way we will allow cross-seam transmission expansion, is that existing, uh, existing <clears throat> HVDC back-to-back -back, uh, connections. Uh, 2B is to say the same thing, that is, we will allow the existing uh, interconnections, uh, the existing back-to-back -back crossing transmission to expand. In addition, we're going to have three HVDC lines uh, connecting at the connected uh, with terminals at the interior part of each respective uh, side, uh, and we chose the number three for <clears throat> uh, essentially a reason related to reliability. It made sense, uh, and uh, and so those can expand too. So essentially, we're giving a additional uh, direct dimension of, uh, of expansion to 2B that 2A did not have. And then finally, 3 is the macro grid, we call it. Uh, and you can see the design of the macro grid here. A uh, key feature to th this design is that we will, <clears throat> a few key features. One is that we will not allow uh, existing back-to-back -back, uh, HVDC to, connect, to expand. The only expansion uh, that we allow for HVDC is along the topology that's uh, in front of you. Uh, and uh, the final constraint is that the expansion of any one link, and it turns out there's 15 links, uh, the, uh, the, the, the expansion of any one link can only be uh, done in, in, insofar as all links will be expanded by that same amount. Uh, so it's not possible to have one of these links expanded to 1,000 megawatts and another expanded to 500, for example. Okay, so these are the four designs that we wanted to study, and I won't go through this slide here, number 17. It simply uh, it essentially summarizes the, the uh, explanation that I gave on the previous slide, uh, and if you want to download the slides, uh, it'll, it'll be for your reading pleasure. So this is... Uh, a little bit of a busy slide, forgive me of this one, uh, but uh, I'm <clears throat> uh, tr suggesting the nature of how we produce the model that was used by the expansion planning program. Uh, so the expansion planning application, CGP plan, uh, is a com compute intensive uh, application, uh, and it, uh, of course, has a greater compute burden as the size of the network increases. Uh, it is uh, at this point in time not tractable to apply 
expansion planning at this level for co-optimization to a full-size planning model. And you have to realize that we're talking about a full-size planning model at the in the inner eastern interconnection and one at the west, right? So so this would be on the order of uh, 60,000 buses plus 20 maybe in that range. So you're at close 80, maybe more thousand buses for a full-scale planning model to get uh, to get uh, representation for both sides. Uh, so we have to do a reduction of both of those models. We use uh, different methods to do that reduction, but we think we ended up with a fairly uh, high quality, high fidelity representation at the level uh, that could be handled at CGP plan. Uh, and I won't say much more about this, uh, but a very interesting part of the overall project that will be discussed uh, perhaps uh, next week at the symposium to some extent uh, is the fact that we also wanted to take the solution, solution from CGP plan uh, and run uh, the production costs uh, during the corresponding to the conditions of the last year. And so that requires, if you will, an inversion of the reduction process, right? We're going to expand the model from this size, which is something on the order of a, uh, between 100 and 200 buses, back to a model of the uh, full-scale kind of planning size. Uh, and so that has some interesting uh, problems in and of itself that I won't say more about. So our focus then is in this part. We have a model. I'll tell you more about it uh, in just a second. We're going to uh, run the CGP expansion planning application, and then we'll get some results, and we'll look at those results. So some assumptions that are important to understand our work. Uh, here's the size of the model, right? We're talking about 169 buses that represent east side and west side, 68 on the east, 101 on the west. Uh, we divided that into four regions uh, simply for purposes of uh, applying uh, applying uh, 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 planning reserve margins. Um, <clears throat> we used uh, very recent uh, data for characterizing wind and solar. Uh, wind in particular, we used 100 meter data that uh, NREL has uh, developed over the past few years. <clears throat> and uh, constraint was imposed that limited investment in generation capacity to 40 gigawatts a year uh, to sort of correspond to the fact that it would be very difficult, we thought, to build more than that. Uh, demand growth and other things were per uh, different reputable resources, including the uh, EIA AEO uh, study uh, that you can get at the web. This has to do with DG. We did model DG, uh, increasing at a level of 3% per year. Uh, operational reserves were also modeled. Very interestingly, they were modeled as a function of the uh, of the in of the installed wind and solar to uh, reflect the fact that increases in wind and solar uh, will also increase variability, thus increasing regulation reserve requirements. Cost information, uh, some of the data there uh, is uh, pertinent maybe, uh, but I'll just, uh, for sake of time, focus on the second one. Uh, we ran this for 15 years starting in 2024, so our last year was 2038. Uh, and each year was simulated, but investments were only allowed every on an every other every second year basis. So seven investment uh, periods. Fuel costs, particularly for gas, is very important. <clears throat> and we modeled in the studies that I'll show you a fuel cost that is characterized by the Energy and Information Administration, their AEO study, uh, as a as a medium or an average uh, gas price uh, a, a projection over the years. So uh, this is really for your study. Uh, I'm, uh, I put this slide in here thinking that there might be uh, a few of you that want to go home on Friday night and uh, spend some time on this table. Um, let me just give you the upshot here in the black boxes. Uh, so a, a, prelim a preliminary statement is this. Um, there's one, two, three designs in blue. These are the economics of those designs according to the rows uh, as specified, right? How much it cost uh, over the 20, over the 15 year period for design 2A, 2B, and 3. Remember this is 2A, the expansion on existing back-to-back -back only. This is expansion on existing back-to-back -back plus the three HVDC lines. And this is the macro grid topology. Uh, and uh, so each one of those three designs is compared to the reference case and you get a delta the deltas uh, show you either, you know, additional costs uh, or additional savings. The blue is the uh, cost or savings. It's always cost, additional cost, 
uh, of the line investments. Uh, the orange are the additional costs associated with the uh, operations. Uh, and uh, so you're seeing that the line investments are positive. That means that relative to the reference, when we had no cross seam transmission, we are uh, spending money, additional money to build transmission. Most of the numbers in orange are negative to sh indicate that we're saving money in all of those cases as a result of that uh, transmission line investment. So what's the upshot here? Uh, the, the top black box is the 15-year benefit to cost ratio, uh, where the benefit is the savings, the additional cost is the blue box of transmission, and if you take that ratio uh, in this particular case, you find for design 2A, you have a benefit to cost ratio of 1.26. Uh, and then uh, for uh, design 2B, it's 1.13, and for design 3, it's 1.15, meaning in design three, you get a benefit that's 15% above the cost that enabled that benefit. Uh, and, and then this box is showing what we've referred to as a perpetuity uh, cost, uh, if, if you will. Uh, and uh, the number is negative, indicate, indicating that these are savings in the design. And so minus 1.45 is suggestive that uh, after the 15-year period, as you go forward in time to year 16 dot 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 uh, to year 35, so for a 20-year period after the 15 years of analysis, you continue to reap a benefit of $1.45 billion per year. Uh, and that's for design 2A, for design 2B it's $2.39 billion, and for design 3 it's $3.62 billion. Uh, the bottom table is showing you capacity uh, for each one of the, the, the different designs. And maybe I, I'll just uh, mention one thing here. Uh, it, it, uh, it gives you some insight uh, uh, about the generation investment. For design one, we invested 461 uh, gigawatts of generation capacity, and that was 225 of wind, 209 of solar, and 27 of natural gas. Uh, in design two, it's about the same. Uh, the allocation's a little bit different, but not much. Uh, in, in design uh, 2B, again, about the same total generation uh, with the allocation changing slightly. In design three, you get a little bit more generation investment uh, and the allocation again stays you know, close, to <clears throat> close to the same. So essentially the generation investment in terms of uh, capacity, total capacity, and in terms of the nature of what got invested, tends to be the same among the three designs. Indeed, among the four designs, all four of these designs have similar generation investment. There's some other information there that you might be interested in that I won't say much more about. Uh, so uh, to go back to that slide uh, I just was talking about, this is for what we refer to as current policy. <clears throat> I neglected to mention this. It's a very important part of the study. Uh, all of this data is based on the notion that there's two things uh, that will remain the same throughout the period of analysis. One is that the RPS that is in place at the various states today will remain in place, and that those uh, impose constraints that must be satisfied in the, uh, in the outcome. So RPS constraints as dictated by each one of the uh, states is being satisfied in all of these uh, simulations, design one, 2A, 2B, and 3. Uh, the other thing <clears throat> that's important to say is that there is no carbon tax here. So as the name suggests, this is current policy. This is where we are uh, today, uh, RPS with, uh, with, with uh, no, no carbon tax. And so we thought it would be interesting <clears throat> to look at a situation where we said, uh, let's think about having a carbon policy, not to suggest we should or should not. We just wanted to take a look at this. And uh, so this is the exact same kind of analysis, except for the fact that we implemented a carbon policy where the uh, cost of generating carbon or producing carbon was at $3 per metric ton per year, increasing year by year, so that it, in 2038, we had something like a $40 per year uh, carbon tax. <clears throat> uh, and and uh, the other thing that was 
done in these simulations was that the RPS requirements were lifted. Uh, and you might say, well, why would you do that if you are implementing a carbon policy simulation? And the reason is because <clears throat> uh, the RPS imposes constraints. And so if you lift constraints, you're bound to get a better economic solution. So we were after looking for the best economic solution in this, uh, with respect to cross-seam transmission uh, investment. So I won't go through the details here except to say that the Benefit cost ratios of these simulations, 2A, 2B, and 3, were a bit higher than in current policy at 2.48, 3.3, 2.52, 3 and then the uh, annual uh, savings post-2038 uh, for 20 years, 1.37 billion, 2.51 billion, and 4.19 billion. So I'll summarize all of this information maybe a little bit more succinctly uh, <coughs> in terms of these two tables. The one on the left it relates to the current policy information. Uh, so you remember we, we had the, uh, the uh, benefit cost ratio uh, and the annualized savings. So the numbers that I showed you on previous tables corresponding to annualized savings for the 20 years after our analysis period are here in this row, right? Those are 1.45, 2.39, 3.62. 2. In addition, uh, I've uh, annualized the savings uh, on the net present worth uh, from 2024 to 2038. So this is an annual savings for Design 2A of $0.08 billion per year, $0.88 billion and $0.22. So please uh, note the difference between these two rows. This annualized savings corresponds to the years 2024 to 2038. This row corresponds to 2039 to 2059. The reason I separate them is because 2024 to 2038 uh, was a simulated period where we uh, modeled uh, demand uh, growth uh, investments and operations. Uh, and 2039, 2059 was not a simulated period. What we did in this period was, said, was, was that we said, if uh, year 2038 operations continues exactly like that for the next 20 years, <clears throat> then this is the savings that you would see. So it's simply a replication of the last year, 2038, for the next 20 years. So uh, and, and in some sense, you could argue that the annualized savings over this time period is based on a, uh, a, a less uh, granular model, uh, whereas the one 2024-2038 is a more higher fidelity model. Uh, so the other thing is to look at annualized savings and, and essentially combine these two uh, sets of numbers using, you know, uh, time value of money and, and, and all that. Uh, and then you get uh, Design 2A showing uh, about a half a billion dollars savings per year, uh, 0.1 billion dollars on Design 2B, uh, and uh, 1.37 on Design 3. Uh, and then if you want to look at net present value over that entire time period, it's $8 billion design 2A, $13 billion on design 2B, and $20 billion on design 3. Uh, similar information is here for carbon policy, and as we showed before with respect to net, uh, benefit cost ratio, you're uh, seeing a little bit higher numbers. Uh, I won't go through the details here, but uh, the net present worth uh, of uh, savings over the entire time period gives you significantly larger numbers here, 25 billion, 44, and 50 billion dollars over that time period. So um, these are some pictures uh, and uh, gives you a sense of where the wind generation, which is in green, was cited, where the solar generation, which is in yellow, was cited, and uh, there's a little, uh, some gas that's uh, cited uh, in various parts of, of the country. This is for D1, uh, where you have no additional cross-seam uh, transmission uh, and D2A, design 2A for the current policy results here. Those circles are where the investments were made and the numbers associated with the in additional capacity for each one of those circles, this would be back-to-back -back HVDC capacity, are given here with a total of 6682 on top of the uh, 1300 megawatts that is, that is there now. And then D2B, where you allow for those back-to-back uh, uh, -back, uh, investments, as well as the three different lines, uh, you have similar numbers or similar uh, information here in the table 
for the uh, for the various back-to-back um, <clears throat> -back connections. And by the way, the rows here correspond to the um, uh, to the longitude of each one of these circles, right? So MC ACDC is this one up top. Uh, Eddy ACDC is this one down at the bottom. And then you have the three lines. Each one of those lines gives 47.79 megawatts times three gives you a total of 20,000 megawatts as opposed to 6,600 megawatts for uh, design 2A. And then finally, design D3 is shown here uh, where we're giving uh, uh, the optimizer is indicating a capacity per segment of 3861 megawatts, giving a total capacity for all of uh, these HVDC lines of almost 58,000 uh, megawatts. Uh, 7,528 miles of line in this case, 3,920 uh, miles of line in this case. So that's current policy. Same information for the carbon policy where we are implementing uh, the carbon tax uh, and uh, also uh, re relieving the RPS constraints. And there you see the numbers go up. So you find it more economic. The, the model finds it more ec economic to invest in increased cross-seam transmission. If you look back at the current policy, you see this is 6,600. Uh, and in this case, it's uh, 21,000 megawatts of capacity in design D2A. Uh, design D2B, you get 35,000, or 30, almost 36,000, and here you get 20,000. Uh, and then in design three, you get 125,000, eight, almost uh, 8.4 gigawatts of capacity per segment, and, and in the current policy, you get 3.8 gigawatts uh, of capacity per segment. So uh, <clears throat> a little bit more on the sensitivity studies that were done here, this is kind of a funny slide, uh, and uh, I'm showing it in order to introduce to you the next slide. What I'm going to show you on the next slide is what does cross-seam generation, uh, excuse me, what does cross-seam transmission do to generation location? Remember, in the, in the uh, tables, those busy tables that I showed you, uh, the, the level, the capacity of total generation and the nature, the technology, gas, solar, or, or wind, uh, did not change a lot from one design to the other. So what changed? Something changed. And indeed, what we'll find is the location of the capacity, of the generation capacity, changed as you move from no cross-team transmission to significant cross-scene transmission. And to make that point, I just want to define W1, W2, and W3 as, I'm going to just give them a name here, cross, uh, I'm going to say these are sub-scenes on the west side, right? So W1 is on the coast, W2 is sort of in the middle, and W3 is right next on, on the eastern uh, boundary of the, of the WEC, right? And same thing over here, we got E1, E2, and E3. E1's on the coast, E2 is sort of in the middle, and E3 is on the western boundary of that interconnection, right? So I'm going to use that information to tell you a little bit about where the generation goes. And, and, and um, <clears throat> for some reason, we only did this for the car carbon policy uh, studies. We did not do it for the current policy. We need to, just haven't got there yet. Um, <clears throat> but this, so this is for the carbon policy. But, but the story is the same in the current policy. It's uh, just maybe a little less. Uh, capacity is being shown. But this is for the reference case when you have no cross seam transmission, right? <clears throat> uh, and, and so the green is uh, wind, the yellow, of course, is solar, and the gray is, is gas. And so it's showing you the amount uh, in each one of those sub seams, right? So E1, this is wind that's getting invested, you know, very close to the coast. And E3, this is this green is the wind that's getting invested, you know, relatively close to the, uh, to the western boundary of the east side. Uh, and, and then uh, same thing over here on the west, right? You don't have a lot of wind getting invested over there on the west coast, uh, but, but, but you got uh, quite a bit, you know, in uh, W3, that would be sort of in the Wyoming uh, area and maybe Colorado area. Uh, and, and then uh, this, these two uh, bars here show the total, right? The total on the west and the total on the east that the optimization model told us was, uh, was most economic to do for these conditions. So what I'm about to show you is the difference of each one of the uh, three designs relative to 
the reference, right, in terms of location and, and amount. And they're a little bit hard to see. Uh, here's the first one. This is design 2A. Uh, but it's very interesting what's happening. What, what I'm showing you is the change uh, on the east side, right, E1, E2, E3 in total, and the change on the west side. So if, it, uh, if the bar is going up, it means that you're getting more generation on that side. If the bar is going down, it means you're getting less generation. And the colors are the same, right? Uh, green is wind, yellow is solar, and uh, the darker one is gas. And so what you're seeing here, just look at the totals, the two totals, to sort of summarize the story. Uh, on the west side, when you do design 2A, when you build that additional uh, cross-seam transmission at the existing back-to-back -back facilities, <clears throat> when you do that, you find that the wind on the west side decreases and the wind on the east side increases. So it's a shift. It's a shift of wind from the west side to the east side. And at the same time, you find uh, solar, which gets invested on the east side, once you build that crossing transmission, tends to be better off being invested on the east side, right? You get a little bit of interplay with respect to gas, but the basic stories here of all three of the designs is that cross-seam transmission tends to move wind investments eastward and solar investments westward. I'm thinking that many of you could have predicted that before I started. So this is an interesting slide and it's simply saying the following thing. I haven't mentioned it yet, but in addition to the HVDC expansion, the model also allowed for AC expansion. <clears throat> and of course, we did not allow AC expansion across the seam, but you could have AC expansion within each interconnection. And so what you're seeing here on the left are the uh, transmission circuits that were expanded under the current policy condition in all designs. So all designs found these uh, investments to be attractive. Uh, and uh, the width of the line is relative to the capacity of the investment. Um, and all of it, so investments that were less than one gigawatt are not being shown. So all of these investments are at least one gigawatt, some of them much more. And on the carbon policy uh, picture, the, the, the uh, same uh, indication is there. These are the transmission, AC transmission circuits that were invested that is found to be attractive by all three, uh, actually all four designs the reference as well as the three cross-seam transmission designs. So some things you can probably, uh, again, might have uh, expected. You're seeing transmission to push, you know, wind eastward over here in the eastern interconnection. You're seeing transmission to push, uh, again, wind and some solar up here uh, down into the south. And then you're also seeing uh, some transmission being built in order to move uh, cross-seam uh, energy uh, to the west coast and also to move some of that interesting wind in Wyoming around both to the northwest as well as to the southwest. So I'm almost done here uh, and uh, we'll uh, take, take your questions in just a second. Uh, last slide is essentially to say uh, we did some sensitivities. I won't go through the details here, uh, but the amount of cross-seam transmission is highest in the carbon policy uh, model and lowest in the current policy model and then various sensitivities with respect to uh, CO2 uh, sharing of capacity, uh, RPS and gas prices were done uh, that resulted in uh, intermediate levels of, of uh, crossing transmission. So I'm gonna wrap up by just focusing on a few points here and you can maybe read the others and if questions come, that'll be great. Uh, but uh, under value, we've seen that crossing transmission looks like it provides some significant value based on moving energy from one side to the other. Uh, and an important feature as well uh, to that value is uh, the ability to share capacity. Uh, and uh, so uh, these are sort of a summary of some of those numbers that I showed you earlier. Uh, but uh, all of the studies done show benefit cost ratio between 1.13 on the low side and 3.3 on the high side. Those are pretty attractive, uh, attractive numbers. Generation capacity uh, is an interesting uh, feature. I said some things about this already, but I want to emphasize capacity sharing uh, that is for a 
annual peak is important and valuable. Uh, if, if you're willing to expand how you satisfy your 15% above annual peak requirement uh, from the current borders and broaden those out a little bit, expand your geographical range of capacity that can satisfy that for you, uh, and, and share from one region to the other, uh, we can save uh, a, a lot of money over the, t over the future time period. Uh, and uh, I do want to mention, too, that uh, the model does the tiresome fossil generation. That's embedded in the model. There's a feature that does that if it's non-economic. But it retains a significant amount of capacity as well, uh, of fossil capacity, uh, some for energy for sure, uh, and, and some of that capacity is retained for uh, purposes of satisfying the, the annual peak. Uh, last comment that I'll make here, non-quantified benefits. It's an acronym that I'll introduce, NQB. There's things we did not ex assess. Dynamics, resilience to long-term uh, high impact uh, disturbances, uh, adaptability to permanent changes. These things were not assessed in this study and I'm going to argue that they also provide additional value that would tend to uh, increase the numbers that we're seeing up here under value. So with that in mind, I'll just remind you of the symposium next week and uh, ask, stop here and, and see if there are any questions. Thank you. Okay, we ran just a little bit over, but there's a few questions that have come in, and I'd like to move to those, Jim. First question is just a, a simple one about uh, whether you broke down the costs and the savings by region or by state. Uh, yes and yes. We have a breakdown, uh, I'm sorry, we broke down by region in terms of the four regions that uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, and uh, so it's a fairly coarse breakdown. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the results were not bro broken down by state. Uh, that could be done, uh, but the level of fidelity of our model with respect to locating it, 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 it in each individual state uh, we'd have to do some assumptions there, but certainly by region, we, 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 we have done that and, and have that information. Okay. And another question on the optimization method. Uh, the question is whether or not the optimization, the co-optimization that you explained initially was used in producing these results, and do you have any sense of how different the, uh, the benefits from the co-optimization run were compared to not using the co-optimization, just using the sort of manual method? Uh, so yes, uh, that, that was the, the message that the co-optimization uh, transmission generation, this, this approach uh, was applied here to generate all of these results. Uh, and uh, alternatively, one could think of first doing a generation expansion optimization and then doing a transmission expansion optimization um, in a sequence, uh, that would be a reasonable way to go and indeed a way that we have gone in the past uh, in the community and the industry <laughs> for many years. Uh, so that was not done here to compare, but, but uh, we have done it in, for other models, for other systems, and uh, just kind of as a very, very rough rule of thumb, uh, we found in other systems that we need something on the order of uh, about 10 iterations to get to a level of maybe 85 or 90 percent of the benefit that co-optimizers obtain. That's a rough, a rough order of uh, measure, and, and certainly it might change a little bit from one system to the other. Okay. Uh, request, we're going to have to wrap it up now, but we have a request here if you could just uh, put back up the conclusions slides so that people can look at that as we're wrapping it up here, Jim, and go back to full screen. I think we lost our full screen there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we're, we're getting to the top of the hour here, so we're going to have to wrap it up. But as I mentioned earlier, an email will go out once the presentation and the audio file have been posted. And I want to let you know that we really appreciate your engagement. We look forward to seeing, <clears throat> to seeing you at our next webinar. It's going to be Tuesday, August 14th at 2 p.m. It's going to feature Babak Inyati the lead engineer for research development and demonstration with National Grid and Waltham Mass. And Babak will present a brief overview of the whole family of 1547 standards with a focus on the status of implementation of the new <coughs> version just passed this year, which addresses the changes from the previous version, uh, especially concerning the requirements for voltage and frequency ride-through, frequency control, steady state voltage regulation, and interoperability. Those are kind of the hot-button issues associated with the expansion in the DG world. 
And with that expansion taking place with PV and battery energy storage on the distribution system, it's another very timely topic and we hope you'll be able to join us again. So further information on all the webinars and meetings can be found on our website, www.esig.energy, under the events tab, newsletters and informational emails. And I also want to point out, as Jim just said, that the webinar you just heard is a very timely backdrop and preview for the upcoming workshop in Iowa next week, which will contain a lot more detail and the other two components of the study that we didn't have time to get into today. And I uh, just want to let you know there's still time to register. So Jim, I want to thank you for a very timely and informative webinar. And thanks again to all of you for your participation. And I look forward to seeing you again next month. So thank you and take care. If, if I could just quickly say, I, I'm, I apologize for not leaving enough time for questions. If there are questions, please send them to me by email, uh, jdm at iastate.edu. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye.